thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, I'm honored to be here and grateful for the opportunity to talk uh, to you about Robinson and Una Jeffers. I'm especially grateful to uh, Jennifer Syme, uh, Shruti Swamy, and Lesha Westerman uh, for planning and hosting this event. The third and final volume of the collected letters of Robinson Jeffers with selected letters of Una Jeffers was released by Stanford University Press just two weeks ago, along with a revised biographical introduction uh, I wrote for volume one, and it's now titled Robinson Jeffers, Poet and Prophet. The collected letters and Poet and Prophet will serve as the basis for my remarks this evening. I'd like, though, before I begin to um, just call your attention to a few guests of honor. Well, you're all guests of honors. I wish I could introduce all of you. But we're, um, I'm grateful tonight that uh, there are four people here from Stanford University Press. Uh, Norris Pope, you can raise your hand if you will, uh, the, the former director and director of uh, scholarly uh, publishing at Stanford. Uh, Bruce Lundquist, um, right there, uh, he designed uh, the collected letters. He's a book designer, so any of you who have an interest in book design, uh, Bruce is responsible for the collected letters and also for um, poet and prophet. Uh, Emily Jane Cohen, the uh, uh, editor of Humanities and Religion and Philosophy, is, is here and Mary-Kate Mako. Um, where's Mary-Kate? Right there, yes, okay. Uh, the Publicity and Public Relations Director. I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, Stanford is here, and it, it speaks to the commitment uh, that not just the book club has to Jeffers, but to uh, one of our uh, greatest institutions in California. Um, Jeffers would be uh, proud of the attention that he's gotten from this club and from Stanford. I'd also like to introduce a special guest, and that is uh, Brenda Jeffers, uh, sitting right here in front of us. Um, she's a native of San Francisco, a longtime member of the book club, and the wife of the late Garth Jeffers, uh, Robinson and Una's son. So we have a direct connection to the Jeffers family through Brenda uh, this evening. I intend to do uh, two things this evening, and that's provide a brief summary of Robinson and Una's life together as revealed through their correspondence, and link that summary to a discussion of Book Club of California publications. I've left time at the end of my uh, presentation for questions uh, and uh, discussion. Uh, the photograph of the Big Sur Coast, or Jeffers Country, as we call it, uh, by the way, was taken by Ansel Adams, a close friend of Robinson and Una Jeffers, and a friend of the Book Club of California as, as well. Let me state at the outset, um, and you probably would guess this would be the case, that um, in my opinion, Robinson Jeffers is the most Im important American poet of his generation. This is debatable, I know. Uh, many people would disagree with me, especially on the East Coast. <laughs> but for mastery of the poetic medium in all of its forms, uh, narrative, dramatic, and lyric, for engagement with the most pressing issues of his time, and for the depth and breadth of his artistic vision, truly cosmic in its reach, I believe he is unequaled. As I say at the end of Poet and Prophet, no study of American history or literature is complete without him. Jeffers was born in near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1887. As some of you may know, his father, William Hamilton Jeffers, was a biblical scholar and seminary professor who expected his son to follow in his footsteps 
at least in regard to the study of languages and literature. Jeffers was educated in Europe, primarily Switzerland, where he mastered Greek and Latin while acquiring fluency in French and German. His father would put him in a school that had a French curriculum uh, that focused on the study of Greek and Latin, and then the next year he'd put him in one with, a, with German teachers. So he was always studying. At that time, English was his third language, really. He was studying Greek and Latin through French and German. And he came out with all four, and certainly with English as well. He uh, moved to the United States, or returned to the United States, and entered Occidental College at age 16 in 1903, and graduated in two years. In 1906, he began graduate studies in uh, literature, at first at the University of Southern California, uh, but dropped out after a semester and enrolled at the University of Zurich. He lasted one semester there as well, and then returned to USC and entered the School of Medicine. When he was at the University of Southern California the first time, he met Una Call Custer in a class on advanced German. And he resumed the friendship when he began his medical studies a few years later. Una, the beautiful wife of attorney Edward Custer, or Teddy as he was known, was pursuing a master's degree in philosophy. The more Robinson and Una saw each other, the more they felt drawn to each other, until one day they passed the point of no return. Writing to friend and biographer Melba Barry Bennett in a letter written years later, Una says, so without the wish of either of us, our love was one of those fatal attractions that happen unplanned and undesired. Very few letters survive from those early years, but here is an excerpt from one written by Robinson to Una in 1910. She's still married. I should add here that uh, in the course of the discussion tonight, I'll use Robinson sometimes and Jeffers other times, depending on the context. But here's Robinson to Una. I did not see you last night, but I felt your thought in your presence plainly for I do not think I imagined them only. And I lay wakeful and longed for you, but for a little while I was a little happy. How I desire your voice, your eyes, your lips, you, my very dearest. And today is black and tomorrow is black, but the next day there is hope of light, darling. I mean, that's a young romantic poet, obviously. Uh, Jeffers dropped out of medical school after three distinguished years of, of study and moved to Seattle, where he enrolled in the graduate program in forestry. Um, he didn't end his relationship with Una, however, and her letters to him, uh, in, in this instance, when he was on his way north, are filled with ardor, hope, and sorrow. Here's an excerpt also from 1910, from Una to Robinson. I do not see how I am to live, very dearest. I cannot see anything ahead for many months, but unending blankness. How can I tell you my utter love, my utter devotion? But you know it. I do not think that time or distance or evil circumstance or cruelty can separate us any more. I am yours, and I shall walk softly all my days until we take each other's hands and fare forth for the wild, red, vivid joys we two must know together. So she matched him passion for passion. This is um, how uh, Robinson looked around that time. Uh, Louis Fleckenstein was the photographer, 1911. And here's the beautiful Una by uh, Arnold Genta, um, also 1911. 
Two more tumultuous years passed before Robinson and Una could be together, uh, two years during which Jeffers drifted in and out of his studies while writing poetry, and Una traveled alone to Europe at her husband's request. Teddy hoped that a long journey abroad would help Una forget Robinson, but she took his photograph with her over there, and it, <laughs> it didn't happen. Out of Teddy's own anguish when he was back in, in Los Angeles um, nursing his wounds, he realized that he could never love Una as a wife again after this lengthy and, and very deep betrayal. So while he was away, he initiated divorce, initiated divorce proceedings. A number of Una's letters to Teddy written during this time are are in volume one, um, and, and they're often heartbreaking in their candor, really. Uh, the, the letters back and forth between Teddy and Una are, are also uh, filled with their own kind of um, heartbreaking uh, passion. When Una returned from Europe at the end of 1912, she ran straight to Robinson who met her uh, just across Union Square at the St. Francis Hotel here in San Francisco. Uh, Robinson had just completed his first volume of poetry, Flagons and Apples. Uh, he published it his, at his own expense, December 4th, 1912, a week before uh, the Book Club of California was founded, um, uh, December 12th, uh, 1912. Obviously, neither Jeffers nor the book club uh, directors at the time knew how their fates would intertwine in succeeding years. I just uh, brought that. I mean, you're all familiar with it, but it's um, the little emblem of, of, of your 100-year celebration. Uh, Robinson and Una married and moved to Carmel in 1913. Their twin sons, uh, Garth and Donnan, were born in 1916, the same year Californians, that's Jeffers' first major book, was published. And Tor House was built in 1919. These were also the war years, World War I, and the years Jeffers struggled to find his voice as a poet. I should add that Teddy also remarried in 1913, uh, moved to Carmel a few years later, and built a, uh, a, a bigger house, just a stone's throw from Tor House. And he and Una remained friends for the rest of their lives. And Garth and uh, Donnan grew up calling him Uncle Teddy. So it had a happy ending after all. When Jeffers was working on Tor House in the summer of 1919, creative lightning struck, as Una explains in a letter to author and UCL, UCLA librarian Lawrence Clark Powell. In 1934, this letter was written. And she tells him that as, as he helped, this is Robinson, the masons shift and place the wind and wave-worn granite. I think he realized some kinship with it and became aware of strengths in himself unknown before. Thus, at the age of 31, there came to him a kind of awakening, such as adolescents and religious converts are said to experience. With the awakening came a new clarity of vision enabling him to see past, present, and future with the eyes of a prophet. And he also experienced a connection, a union, a mystical union uh, with all that is. I won't read it now, but if there's time at the very end, uh, maybe after the question and answers, um, there's a beautiful passage in the Tower Beyond Tragedy that captures that experience of <coughs> mystical union. And I'll share it with you later if, if there's time. But inspired by the uh, poetic break breakthrough, Jeffers wrote Tamar, a long narrative poem 
about a troubled young woman who lived with her family on Point Lobos, just south of Carmel. He published the narrative himself in 1924 in a book titled Tamar and Other Poems. And I know many of you know uh, some of these books and some of these titles and, and even some of this story. But at the same time, he finished building Hawk Tower. That was the uh, second um, structure on their property, which was about five acres right on Carmel Point. And he named it for a hawk that uh, kept him company as he was building Hawk Tower. Tor House, by the way, was named after, the, there's an English word, word, an old English word, Tor, which means hill, and it's just really a house on a hill. Uh, it was based on a Tudor barn that Una had seen in 1912 when she was in England. Here's uh, the area on Carmel Point. If any of you have been there, you might, uh, well, you couldn't recognize it now. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, And here's another photograph of, of Una with the twins uh, near the very rocks where uh, Tor House was, was constructed. And here is um, uh, Tor House, uh, and that's Uncle Teddy in, in the doorway. Here's um, another view of Tor House. And now we'll move to... Um, it's a beautiful uh, uh, home, and if any of you have an opportunity on the weekends, it's open to, to visits uh, uh, to the public, and you can tour it, and it, it's really uh, quite an event. Uh, that's uh, Hawk Tower under construction. No one knows exactly how he got all of the stones into place. Some of them weighed 400 pounds, but he did it um, all by himself. Uh, rolling them up um, using a hoist and uh, putting them into place with his bare hands. And um, this is Hawk Tower uh, after it was completed. There's a hidden staircase that gives you claustrophobia when you go up it inside, a twisting staircase. It's, it's fun. Children love it. And then finally, here's... Um, uh, Tor House and Hawk Tower after both were completed, and that's uh, Robinson and his twin sons up on the turret. It was at this moment in 1924 or, or so that San Francisco poet and previous resident of Carmel, George Sterling, reached out to Jeffers. Sterling, uh, James Rorty, and Genevieve Taggart were putting together an anthology of California poets for the Book Club of California. And knowing that Jeffers had written a book titled Californians, they asked him to contribute. Jeffers sent five poems, including Continent's End, which Sterling, Rorty, and Taggart chose for the title poem and frontispiece for their book published in 1925. As a courtesy, Jeffers also sent Sterling and Warty copies of Tamar and other poems. No one had purchased the book. He had paid for it himself. And uh, a shipping carton with almost all of the copies had been sent back to him, and they were in a storeroom at, at Tor House. So he sent one to Rorty and uh, Sterling, uh, both of whom were overwhelmed by what they read. Uh, they sent uh, their copies to friends in New York. Um, they reviewed them in, new, in the New Republic and Nation, and uh, Jeffers was famous overnight. If one were to look for a first cause, a prime mover, the, the, the very force that got Jeffers' career um, in motion, it was Continent's End and the Book Club of California. It's, it's just amazing. Uh, without this publication, um, uh, I, I, who knows what would have happened. Uh, he could have died in obscurity for all we know. But because of this book and because of Sterling and Taggart and Rorty, um, the Book Club of California launched his career. Uh, a new edition of Jeffers' book, uh, titled Roan Stallion, Tamar, and Other Poems, 
was published by Bonai and Livewright in 1925. Jeffers' next book, The Women at Point Sur, appeared in 1927. And in the summer of that year, the Book Club of Cal California reached out to Jeffers again. Writing to the incomparable Albert Bender, and I'm sure many of you know that name, a San Francisco legend, uh, writing to him, he was secretary of the book club at the time, in 1927, Jeffers says, let me thank the book club most cordially, and you as a member of it, for the distinguished honor you have done me in conferring honorary membership. Someday I hope it will be possible for me to be in San Francisco and thank some of my friends in person. For the present, the concentration involved in staying at home seems to be necessary for getting done whatever I have to do, but I value your kindness all the more. This letter reveals two things about Jeffers that we encounter throughout his correspondence. One, his graciousness, always sincere, and two, his reluctance to leave home. He preferred a routine that allowed him to do what he had to do, and that is um, write poetry, work with stones, and take care of his family. In the following year, 1928, the Book Club of California honored Jeffers with the publication of Poems, a beautiful little book that featured a photograph of Jeffers by Ansel Adams and a number of important poems, including Hurt Hawk's Night and Shine Perishing Republic. Writing to Albert Bender again, this time Una, Una says, we are both more than content with the book. It is beautifully done. The clear, distinguished type in the placing on the page and the beautiful paper, a book to make one proud. I hope you will not mind my answering your letters. Robin is at present almost in a daze. He is putting the finishing touches on his new volume for Bonai and Livewright, and although it is practically finished, there seems to be much for him to think about it still, and it is a wrench for him to come back from that other, and she starts to write subconscious, and she gets halfway through that and strikes it through, and, she, and then she says in parentheses, I was going to say subconscious, but that's not quite the word, and then she completes the sentence, uh, come back from that other world to give a rational answer to even a simple question. Like the previous letter that Robinson wrote to Bender, this one also tells us something about Robinson and Una, things that show up throughout their correspondence. One, uh, Una answered many of his letters. She really was the mediator between him and the world. He, in some ways, kind of uh, stood behind Una. Uh, he was a shy person uncomfortable um, in social situations. Una was the opposite, very gregarious, and uh, she handled all of the um, human contact that uh, they had, uh, really, and which itself, though, was, was really enormous. They had many, many friends. And the other thing that her comment makes, uh, 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 helps us understand about his, his writing, coming back not quite from the subconscious, some other zone. Uh, it was something like the hyperconscious, and I don't even know quite how to describe it, except it was a, uh, a mental state of hyper ecstatic rationality, uh, very lucid, um, but also visionary, mantic or prophetic as as I try to say in, in this uh, biography. Uh, the book that he was completing uh, when this one came out was Cawdor and Other Poems. And when it was published near the end of 1928, uh, readers across the country knew for certain that a major talent had arrived. This is Jeffers in 1928. Johann Hagemeyer was the photographer and this is Una around the same time, 
also by Johann Hagemeyer. I'm going to jump to 1935. By 1935, uh, the year Jeffers contributed a short essay to a George Sterling keepsake printed by the Book Club of California, Jeffers was believed by many to be the most important poet in America. And much had happened in the intervening years. In 1929, Jeffers published Dear Judas and Other Poems. Also in 1929, Jeffers and Una and their twin sons traveled throughout the British Isles. In 1930, Robinson and Una began a friendship with Mabel Dodge Lewin, a wealthy socialite and writer, and they vacationed at her home in Taos, New Mexico that summer and several times after. We'll come back to that. Descent to the Dead, a, poem of, a, a book of poems inspired by the trip to the British Isles, was published in 1931. Jeffers' original publisher, Live Right, declared bankruptcy. And after a bidding war, Jeffers and Eugene O'Neill signed with Random House in 1932. And Thurso's Landing was published in that year. Also in 1932, Jeffers was uh, on the cover of Time magazine. And that's a portrait by Edward Weston. Give Your Heart to the Hawks came out in 1933. Solstice and Other Poems in 1935. He was really uh, working at the top of his form. And I'll come back to this uh, Book Club of California publication, Western Authors. This keepsake, honoring his friend and fellow poet George Sterling, came at the, at the high point some say 1935 was the high point of, just, of Jeffers' career. Just prior to this time, Jeffers had begun to feel restless and uneasy about his own life and the present human condition. And just after this time, he entered a, a moment of emotional upheaval and creative exhaustion. Indications of trouble show up in Yuna's letters. In a May 1934 letter to Phoebe Barkan, Phoebe and her husband Hans Barkan, a San Francisco physician, were close friends of Robinson and Yuna. Yuna says, Life has been going smoothly here, me sitting on the lid. We have gone off for one whole day by ourselves in the hills every week and walked for two hours, late afternoons, almost every day. And Robin has been content. No, there hasn't been any real intention of deserting Carmel. It's only I have said now and again, if I can't manage to give Robin an illusion of a wilder, more rural home, we'll have to go elsewhere. Somehow, I've managed to give that illusion. That beautiful barren Carmel Point was being filled up with houses, and uh, it didn't make Robinson happy. The turmoil came to a head in 1938 uh, at the home of Mabel Dodge Lewin in Taos, New Mexico. Jeffers had a brief but very intense encounter relationship with another guest, a concert violinist named Hildegard, Hildegard Donaldson. And Yuna, she was a very uh, emotional woman, uh, reacted with jealousy and self-destructive despair. Uh, in short, um, after a scene between the two of them, she downed a vial of sleeping pills stepped into a tub, pulled out a revolver, put it to her heart, pulled the trigger, and how it happened, I don't know, but I asked a surgeon and he had seen it before. The bullet glanced off her sternum and traveled under her skin, 
around her rib cage and came out her back. Uh, she lived, uh, but she was deeply wounded physically and psychologically. Volume two contains a half a dozen or so letters that Robinson wrote to Hildegard in the aftermath of this event. And the story of how I found three of them at Yale University is, is kind of interesting. So during the question and ask, uh, answer period, if anybody wants to know about that, ask me. And I'll tell you um, how I got those letters uh, from Jeffers to Hildegard. This is um, Jeffers in 33, but it was um, uh, signed in 1936. This is Una uh, in 36, around there. This is um, Donnan, uh, the one twin, uh, and also in, in, in 37, and this is Garth in 37. That's Brenda's late husband. And this is Robinson and Dorothy Brett in the middle and Hildegard, uh, the woman in the white dress uh, facing Robinson. On the back of another photograph, uh, Una doesn't write her name. She identifies people on the, on the backs of photographs. And instead of writing Hildegard, she writes, a snake. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks after the attempted suicide, in a letter to friends Timmy and Maud Clapp, Una describes her ongoing emotional turmoil. Uh, Timmy, by the way, was Frederick Mortimer Clapp, uh, founding director of the Frick Collection in New York and one of Una's oldest and dearest friends. He has not been drinking anymore, but has been an angel of patience and needed to be. I've been very difficult. I have had days of dark melancholy, for my nerves are still a bit unstable. Other days we have talked very quietly and sensibly about his difficulty writing, and I think we have hit upon a few plans to ease that up. There have been days when I was such a whirlwind of anger and resentment that I have almost blown the roof off, and us through it, and other times of such tempestuous lovemaking as if this menace to our life together forced us to express to its extreme bounds the passion which we have always felt for each other. Not a very restful period. Well, Robinson and Una struggled to find their equilibrium during this time, and for the most part, they were able to do so. In 1940, oh, I, I should say, um, well, in 1940, uh, Jeffers was asked by the Book Club of California to um, write a foreword to a collection of poems by D.H. Lawrence. And uh, he did so. He, he wasn't real complimentary. But uh, <laughs> Lawrence had been a friend of Mabel Dodge Lewin's as well. And uh, this was Mabel Dodge Lewin's house in Taos, New Mexico, uh, where she brought all of her, her friends. And I thought I would bring this photograph, too. It's, it's a room of, it, it's the bathroom. The tub is on the, the left side. That's where Una tried to kill herself. But the windows were all painted by D.H. Lawrence. Now, um, during the war years, uh, Jeffers didn't publish a lot. Um, he published one book, Be Angry at the Sun, in 1941. Uh, Donnan did not serve in, in the military. He had a heart murmur and was deferred. But Garth was a, 
a member of a combat military police brigade and, and fought in both the Pacific and the European theaters, um, which kept Robinson and Una awake most nights. After the war was over, the book club published this keepsake, Natural Music, and uh, this was really another high point in Jeffers' career. Uh, Medea, his adaptation of Euripides' play, starring Dame Judith Anderson, uh, opened on Broadway just as this came out. Here's a, the inside of it. And um, Jeffers was back kind of on top. Uh, the play was called A Landmark of the Modern Stage, and uh, it was performed the world over. In the following year, in 1948, I'm going to move to a, a photograph of, of Una at this time. Uh, Una pub or Robinson published The Double Acts and Other Poems, a book that uh, was difficult for many because it was uh, an attack against um, war and America's involvement in war, and it included a, a discussion of his controversial philosophy of life, which he called inhumanism. Uh, in a letter uh, to a friend to, to define what he meant by inhumanism, Jeffers wrote, we know that the human race is minute and momentary. It will disappear, disappear after a while and leave no trace. But the beauty of this planet and the splendors of the universe will go on. I think we ought to realize this knowledge habitually in our thought. I don't find mankind in general an, up, uh, an inspiring or lift, uplifting object of contemplation, but certainly land and sea and the stellar universes are beautiful, and to contemplate them calms the mind and ennobles it. Um, and that's uh, how Jeffers looked at the, about the time that he uh, wrote those words. Robinson and Una traveled to the British Isles again in 1948. Um, he almost died there with an attack of pleurisy. Um, Una was uh, uh, apart from him for a short time. She went over to Scotland to uh, see the opening of Medea there, and their letters back and forth to each other gave both of them an opportunity to um, express, as they always had, uh, their love for one another. The events of, of the past were in the past, and uh, they had um, recovered, uh, really by the mid-1940s, uh, their uh, long and uh, deep and true love. When they came back in 1948, Jeffers required, or, or he, he recovered, but Una declined. Uh, she had uh, a recurrence of, of a cancer, and she died um, uh, slowly, but she died in, in 1950. Uh, Jeffers wrote a, a beautiful poem in her honor called Hungerfield that the Book Club of California wanted to publish uh, a kind of a special edition of, but Random House wouldn't allow them to. But um, Ted Lilienthal, another name some of you might know, uh, published a keepsake volume um, in 1954. The book itself was published by Random House in, in 1954, and it expresses many of Jeffers' uh, concerns. In, this is, I should have shown this uh, photograph before, it's uh, Robinson and Una, just before Una died. In 1956, the book club published Themes in My Poems, and this was based on a lecture that Jeffers had given while he was on a speaking tour, the one and only speaking tour of his life in uh, 1941. He was asked to inaugurate a special program at the Library of Congress, and he added to that some appearances at Harvard and and uh, other universities. And the book club 
got a hold of a, a transcript of that lecture and published it as a keepsake in 1956. James Hart, uh, professor and later director of the Bancroft Library, was behind that, uh, this publication. And he was also behind um, this one, published in 1961, uh, my first publication, a, a collection of essays by important California authors about their first books. And Jeffers' contribution was actually called First Book. It was an essay published many years earlier. Um, it was probably the last book with one of his publications in it that Jeffers ever saw. Um, it was published in 1961, and um, he died, it's uh, him before he died, uh, in uh, 1962. Um, this is a photograph by Lee Weiner. Uh, showing Jeffers with the ocean behind him. And then I really like this one. It's the last photograph of Jeffers I'll show tonight um, with a cigarette and kind of a hawk-like stare at whoever's out there, and that, that would be us. The Book Club of California did not forget Jeffers after he died, and in 1989, they published a book of Gaelic airs. This is an invitation to a reception um, announcing or uh, uh, honoring that book. Here's the cover or the, the title page for that book. It's a collection of songs that Una played on her melodions. She had three and a Steinway grand piano at Tor House. The house had to be built around the piano. Um, and here's how the um, pages look. Uh, they're songs that Una had collected, and the drawings are all by Robinson. So they worked on this little project together. There's another one. In the years following this publication, uh, the book club continued to honor Jeffers uh, through s research grants and other means. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, in fact, uh, the book club gave me a research grant to help support travel for the, the collected letters and also for Stones of the Sur. And I know they've also helped a research scholar who's coming out with a, a beautiful and monumental descriptive bibliography uh, called a, a, His Place for a Story. I think it's something like that. Michael Broomfield, um, uh, watch for it. It's coming out soon through uh, Oak Knoll Press. It's really a, an extraordinary record of dedication when you think of it, uh, what the Book Club of California has done for uh, California's most important poet, I would say. Uh, they've stayed with him through the years, uh, through the ups and downs of his reputation, and they're helping to revive interest in him even now. Uh, along with Stanford, of course, uh, who has behind, been behind Jeffers as well. When it came time to um, publish Jeffers' collected poetry, Stanford turned to the legendary uh, printer and designer here in San Francisco, Adrian Wilson. Uh, he was behind the design of, of the collected poetry in five volumes. And Bruce Lundquist, the designer for Stanford, uh, used that uh, design for the collected letters as, as well. It's interesting for those of you who, who know about Adrian Wilson, that just about the first thing that he did um, as a young printer starting out was a little publication for um, uh, Mildred Ligda and her husband. Uh, they had a little press called Hermes Publication, and they wanted to do a single poem, Meditation on Saviors, and they asked uh, Adrian Wilson to design that. So uh, the first project for Adrian Wilson and the last project 
uh, just about for Adrian Wilson. Both had something to do with, um, with Robinson Jeffers. Volume three, uh, like volumes one and two, in fact, um, have a lot of information about uh, the printers that have been behind Jeffers. Uh, Ward, Ritchie, uh, the Grabhorn brothers, uh, Ted and Fran Lilienthal, and other printers like the Ligdas. Uh, in fact, uh, for de detailed information, uh, the collected letters allow Robinson and Una to tell their own story in their own words. It really is um, more an autobiography than anything, and that's been one of the greatest pleasures uh, that I've had, and that is allowing Robinson and Una to tell their own stories uh, through, through their own words with all their friends and the things that happened in Tor House and even stories about a pet rooster named uh, Porthos. I close my um, introduction to volume three with a statement uh, about that. Um, I say, the collected letters is in essence an autobiography, composed jointly over decades without forethought or design. Brought together in this edition, Robinson's and Una's letters fit like tiles in a vast mosaic. The portrait thus created of an extraordinary couple living on the edge of the continent at a turning point in history is set against a backdrop formed by Tor House, the Carmel Coast, and the ancient shimmering sea. Now here are two tiles in their original forms that fit in that vast mosaic. This is what Robinson's handwriting looks like. It's small and tight and fluid. He usually used a pen dipped in ink, but sometimes used a pencil. His letters are rarely more than one or two pages. Second page. You can go a little batty trying to figure what those words are sometimes. And here's um, uh, Yuna's handwriting. It's larger, uh, more rolling, and effervescent. She also used a pen and ink and really wrote as if she were talking face to face with people. She could write five, 10, 15 pages at a time. It's the second page. Here's uh, the shimmering sea. Uh, an, another Ansel Adams photograph. I'd like to end uh, with a recollection by Una, followed by a poem by Jeffers. Uh, the recollection by Yuna is from an article she wrote for the Carmel Pinecone in 1940. So began our happy life in Carmel, she says, looking back at their first year of marriage, full and overfull of joy from the first. For a long time we knew no one, but were busy from morning till night anyway. Robin was writing poetry his reputation yet to make. I was studying certain aspects of late 18th century England and receiving from the State Library at Sacramento through the Little Village Library priceless packages of old and rare books on my subject. There was housework and continual wood chopping to fill the maw of the great fireplace in our drafty cabin. We bought simple textbooks on flowers, shells, birds, and stars, and used them. We explored the village street by street, followed the traces of the moccasin trail through the forest, and dreamed around the crumbling walls of the old mission. When we walked up from the shore at sunset, scarfs of smoke drifting up from the hidden chimneys 
foretold our own happy supper and evening by the fire. Despite the problems they faced and the up and down in their own relationship, that's essentially how they lived their entire lives. And we can picture them on any given evening sitting in the flickering lamplight with nothing but the sound of the nearby ocean and the crackling flames. Una might be sewing. She sewed all of Robinson's shirts. She made over a hundred. Um, or perhaps writing a letter at her desk. And uh, Robinson would almost certainly be reading and um, maybe a poem that he wrote earlier in the day. And so I'll conclude with a poem, um, one of my favorites called Gray Weather. It is true, older than man and ages to outlast him, the Pacific surf still cheerfully pounds the worn granite drum. But there's no storm, and the birds are still. No song, no kind of excess, nothing that shines, nothing is dark. There is neither joy nor grief nor a person. The sun's tooth sheathed in cloud, and life has no more desires than a stone. The stormy conditions of time and change are all abrogated. The essential violences of survival, pleasure, love, wrath, and pain, and the curious desire of knowing, all perfectly suspended. In the cloudy light, in the timeless quietness, one explores deeper than the nerves of nature, the womb or soul, to the bone, the careless white bone, the excellence. Thank you very much. You've been went a little longer than I thought. I'm sorry, your patience. I appreciate it. Any questions or comments? He inherited a very little about, amount of money. His father, despite, he was, despite the fact that he was a professor, um, in, he inherited some money from a first wife. And that allowed him to um, live really way beyond the means of a seminary professor uh, to, to a big home outside of Pittsburgh, um, uh, putting his son in boarding schools in, in Zurich um, uh, for years at a time. And when he came back to, to California and they moved into La to the Los Angeles, his father did some real estate speculation. So um, there was some money there and then a, um, another relative left Jeffers uh, a little bit of money, even before he met Yuna, that he put in the bank and uh, drew from, uh, really for many years after. Uh, something like $200 a month was all. But um, $2,400 a year in 1912, mm -hmm. that's good money. And um, once they bought their house and uh, they didn't have a telephone, they didn't have electricity, uh, and they built the house uh, with raw materials near at hand, very little expenses. And so um, his poetry was successful. And certainly when Medea uh, took off, uh, a lot of money came in then, that was later in their lives. But um, they were able to uh, make a go of it. I should say the redoubtable Albert Bender, who took care of all of his friends, um, sent them a check when he knew that they wanted to go to the British Isles and uh, help pay for that trip. And um, all of their friends were um, really very wealthy people. Uh, not that Robinson and Una uh, made use of their wealth, but they were, they, there was kind of an updraft um, with the people that they were around. Uh, the, the Frick collection, um, 
uh, uh, Timmy Clapp, who, who was running that, um, even the Barkans, a, a successful physician here in San Francisco, uh, the Fishes, uh, the Moors in, in Carmel. Uh, these were people with 25,000 acre ranches uh, and uh, huge homes up in the foothills there. So um, there was just kind of money around them, and they lived quite comfortably through the years. Good question. Yes. Yes, it was in Taos, and she recovered there and uh, came back um, to Tauho, to, to, to Tor House and, and regained her strength slowly. That, that reminds me about those letters that, about uh, Hildegard. All of the, there are about, um, I ended up uh, finding about 3,000 letters, uh, about 1,000 from Robinson, 2,000 by Una. And they're everywhere. Um, and I ended up with about 1,000 from each person. So it's pretty balanced. Um, uh, Yuna's voice comes through loud and clear because hers are, are longer. But in any case, uh, there are many archives around the country that have them. Uh, at Texas, uh, Berkeley, uh, Harvard, Columbia, and Yale. They, they have Mabel Dodge Lewin's uh, uh, papers there, and they even have Timmy Clapp's letters. But Hildegard Donaldson was the wife of the editor and director, the, the director of Yale University Press. So, um, and they, she was in an unhappy marriage with him. Um, I don't know how it worked out exactly, but she got into an affair with one of his students. Uh, he, uh, he taught classes as well. And that ended just before she came to Taos. So she came to Taos kind of on the rebound from a unhappy marriage and the breakup of an affair. And Robinson was just having trouble with all sorts of things. And so they had... Uh, uh, all we know is something happened behind closed doors, and we don't know what. Um, I think she was in her early 40s. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, yes. But anyway, um, there are three letters to her that Robinson wrote that are in Texas. But they weren't, I, I thought maybe there was s some more. Uh, um, out there. So I contacted Yale University Press and I asked them if they knew anything about the Donaldson family, uh, about the editor or director and his wife Hildegard, and anything about an affair involving Robinson Jeffers. And it was all ancient history. They knew nothing about it. But the person I talked to um, just happened, and it was just a, whoever answered the phone that day said that, you know, there's a, a man that's writing the history of Yale University Press, and he's doing some research right now. So I'll give you his name, and you can call him. So I called him, and I said, uh, do you know anything about the Donaldson uh, family, and specifically Hildegard? Never heard of them. I said, uh, do you know anything about this affair? And I told him, what I knew about the 1938 event, and it was all news to him. And he said, I'm sorry, I, I can't help you. So I hung up the phone, and I, I figured that lead was, was done. About no less than a week later, he called me back, and he said, um, you'll never believe what happened. Uh, a woman was at a yard sale, and she's a graduate of Yale. And things were um, being auctioned off sight unseen. They, things were in boxes. So it was kind of a grab bag sort of uh, event. And there was a box that came up on the table, and it said, Donaldson Family Papers, um, Yale University Press. And she said, I didn't know what was in it, um, but I bought it. And I haven't opened it. Uh, do you want to see it? 
And he said, well, of course. He's writing the history of, of the press, and here's one of the directors. Give me the book, or give me the box. So she sent the box over to him, and that's when he called me. And he said, I have this box. It says Donaldson Family Papers. Do you want me to open it and see if there's anything in there from Robinson to Una <laughs> about this, this event? I mean, Robinson and Una. Robinson and Hildegard, I'm sorry, yeah. And I said, of course. And he said, okay, send me a check for $200, <laughs> and I will open the box. So I did. I, I sent him uh, a check for $200, and a week later, he said, you'll never believe what I found. I've got two letters here from Robinson to Hildegard, and they really are the, 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 the real thing. Uh, you, you'll really want to see them, and I'll send them photocopies right away if you want them. I mean, he knew I did, and so I said yes, and I, I said, was there anything else in there? And he said, well, I haven't gotten to the bottom of the box, and I said, well, could you look for me, please? <laughs> and he said, yes, but that'll be another $200. <laughs> So he, he did find another letter, uh, but it was a, a real strange experience for me <laughs> to, to have these very important historical documents. I mean, they're uh, essential to anyone who, who cares anything about Jeffers, because this has been a mystery for decades, you know, what happened in 1938. Um, uh, but he really worked me over with that one. Uh, and they were important letters, and, and the last one he found, um, Robinson writes to Hildegard and says, um, please burn these. Uh, I, I don't want anyone to know anything about um, this uh, sorry uh, event that we've, we've been through. But of course she didn't uh, burn them, and uh, I, we're the better for it. I mean, we've, we've got six letters, and uh, they do tell us a lot about what happened in 1938. So that was quite a story. Thanks for uh, asking. They're, they're at the Beinecke, and so you can, you can check them out. Another, and, and for you people, I mean, I know you all care about documents. It was kind of a strange thing, too. He sent me the, um, the materials right out of the box uh, with an envelope um, for one letter, and the other ones were just in there, with the, the sheets. And um, I went back to Yale. I, I had to go back to all of these places several times, and I, I looked at them uh, up close. But whoever cataloged the material threw away the envelope for some reason. And uh, it was kind of a, a dumb thing to do because it was a unusual handwriting, and, and I wasn't sure if Robinson had addressed the letter to Hildegard or if he asked one of his sons to do it. Uh, it looked to me like it might have been um, the handwriting of his son, Donnan, which also tells us that the, his sons uh, understood what was going on and really behind their mother's back. Uh, they helped Robinson wrap up the loose ends. Uh, um, he never saw Hildegard again, and they never communicated. Yes, they would go for about six weeks. Um, so um, it was, and it was a, it was a, really uh, a, an interesting time. And I, you can almost imagine how it occurred. One of the uh, first visitors who had arrived before Robinson and Una was a man named A. A. Brill, and he was um, the foremost uh, Freudian psychiatrist. Uh, a student of Freud, and he, he's the one who translated all of Freud. And in 1938, he had just come out with um, the selected edition, a kind of a one-volume uh, collection of, of Freud's papers. And um, they had dinner with Brill, the Robinson and Una, and Hildegard, and Mabel. And uh, what A.A. A. Brill did was tell stories about 
uh, sexual repression and how awful it is to uh, uh, <laughs> uh, hold back when there's a life urge. And uh, that's not what Jeffers needed at that time. <laughs> and um, just after uh, he left, um, Thornton Wilder arrived. And uh, he proceeded to have a breakdown uh, at that, that summer at Mabel's house. And then Mabel wrote to Dr. Brill, who was her psychiatrist. She was a mess. Um, she said, is it me? You know, what's, what's going on here? First Una, now Thornton. Um, uh, what's happening in, in my home? But um, yeah, it was quite a, quite a place. It was known by all of their friends, but it was not public knowledge. Yeah, but all of the friends in, in the literary community um, knew about it. And also the, um, the California friends like Lawrence Clark Powell and Ward Ritchie, uh, the people who published Jeffers here and knew Jeffers, um, they all knew about it. But no one knew the details about um, and there was always speculation, you know, what happened? Uh, was there something? Who's the woman? Nobody even knew her name until these letters were, were found. Um, and she was always misidentified uh, prior to uh, uh, these, these letters. So it was, it was pretty shrouded in mystery for, for a long time. Um, how did, well, he... He has one of the most, I don't know, heart-wrenching, searing denunciations of human cruelty and violence written in the 20th century. No other American poet uh, uh, um, tried to deal with the catastrophe of, of World War II in the way that Jeffers did. And it, it really ruined his career for a while. Because um, in 1948, when the double acts came out, um, and he wrote about Hiroshima, and uh, there's a description of the, of the bomb going off, going off in that book. Um, people were trying to rebuild and regather and wave the flag. But um, Jeffers wrote this poem, a very strange poem, uh, called the uh, uh, the double acts. Uh, the first part is called the love and the hate. And what he does, and, and he pulls it off, he, he um, tells the story of a young man who was killed in the war, uh, who comes back, Jeffers is always ahead of his time, so he, I mean, now there's this current, current interest in the waking dead, in, in zombies. Uh, he comes back as, as a zombie. Uh, to um, kill his mother, who's having an affair with uh, a young man, and to kill his father. And at one point, and, and this is where it gets really gruesome, he pulls his, uh, his shirt open and his chest has been blown out. And he uh, forces his mother to stick her hand inside his body and feel his jagged bones. And that's what Jeffers did to the American uh, readership. I mean, he, he just put people right in that war, and, uh, and people couldn't handle it. I mean, it was just, uh, uh, he was denounced for his, um, uh, his opposition uh, and his uh, gruesome pro pro portrayal of the horrors of war. And he came up with a, another I um, image that hit people subliminally but anybody knew what he was after. When the young man kills his father, um, his father is a, a real flag-waving patriot, and uh, the boy, um, his son, shoots him off his horse, and he falls onto the ground um, and crawls uh, as if he were paralyzed. And there's a, a correlation between um, this patriot who's paralyzed from the waist down and Roosevelt uh, 
uh, the uh, person who was uh, behind the war. And that's where even Random House, um, they couldn't take it. They, they published, and some of you probably know this, a, um, a statement at the beginning of the book, Double X, uh, which says we need to go on record with uh, our disapproval of this book. Uh, we cannot endorse anything said by Jeffers in it, but um, he's, he's a major poet, and he deserves to be heard. But um, uh, it, that's also unheard of in, in the annals of, of American publishing, I think, that the publisher would say, uh, we don't like this book, but um, you ought to read it. Fortunately, Volume 3 kind of clears some of that up. They weren't really suppressed. Uh, Jeffers and his, his editor, Sachs Cummins, went back and forth um, about how to uh, put this book together. And um, Sachs would have published anything Jeffers wanted him to publish, but Sachs did insist on a few revisions to some of the poems, and Jeffers said okay. But they weren't really suppressed. They were revised a little bit in places. Please join me in thanking. Well, thank you. Thank you.